Okay, good morning and good afternoon for students and colleagues from Department of Architecture ITS. So today it's an honor for us to have Professor Philip once again uh, in our classes, uh, specifically in this online setting. But it is a blessing for us because we don't have to invite him to go to our campus directly, <laughs> which is uh, with, which will take a very long hours to come. So here we are again in this online meeting setup. Uh, today we will um, get knowledge more about the four space framework application because it's actually specific for the um, design principles for the studio, the third studio. So I hope that today uh, Professor Philip will give you more knowledge about the framework and also after the lecture, um, students who have been selected can give the presentation and each student will be given five minutes maximum to present their work and then followed by the inputs and comments from Professor Philip. So I think we should save time for Professor Philip. Now I will give time for Professor Philip to start the lecture. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Fancy. I appreciate you inviting me. Um, and it's it's nice to almost kind of see everybody, although I'm getting a little tired of this format. I actually like going places and visiting. So you um you get a different sense of the people. Um, so I appreciate the um the offer today. I was a little unsure of what to do, um, just because this is you know, when we talk about forces, forces is actually the primary type of information that, that we oh, use in design. Okay. Um, and so the framework itself, though, is, is quite particular in, in how we use it. So what I thought I'd do is maybe just run through an overview of how we think about forces and, and the sort of common ones that we deal with, and maybe as, as they scale into more complex. And I'll, I'll talk about the way I think about information. So I work, I work mostly in um, cognitive semantics and methodology that has to do with um, how we do things and why we do things. Um, and I, I work in, in levels of um, embodied cognition. Um, and so I'm gonna just throw up a screen. And so this, this uh, the way I think about design, the way I think about architectural design in particular, is simply through information. Right? Everything we deal with is, is about information. So as professional designers, um, I feel that the primary role that we have is the organization and the association of elements of information with each other that then affects formal outcomes. That's architecture, that we take a series of hopefully not random ideas, um, we take we take things that we know and things that we believe, and we consider how those things affect the composition of the world around us. And then we react by shaping that composition to align with ideas and information, um, hopefully, or we can work the other way too, um, which is where we believe something might happen. And we, we then um, in some ways arrange, arrange our composition to hopefully make that thing happen. Ultimately, it doesn't matter whether you're using um, you know, any of the frameworks we have, and we have you know, three major ones that have to do with patterns, forces, and concepts, but they, forces um, and patterns work very differently to the way concept operates. All of them though use forces. Uh, when we use a pattern framework, we actually use called a codified force, which is a force which has become solidified over time by success. So if we do something over and over and we find that thing successful, it becomes a pattern. And then that pattern can be used to develop compositional outcomes. Um, although the force-based method, when we start aligning different types of method that comes out of that framework, that uses forces in a way which is ultimately um, starts out being non-hierarchical. And so it's an emergent process. It starts from the bottom up by arranging your information, by doing research, by pulling information into your project. You allow that information to interact with each other to then start to propose an outcome. The, the thing about when we do force-based projects is that we don't 
actually often know what we're going to get before we get it. We also, but so we use forces in that. We also use forces in concept frameworks, but the difference between a concept framework and a force-based framework is direction of, um, of effect. So where a force-based framework uses emergence and so that we, we allow the information to start to play with each other. And then we start to propose outcomes based on that. So it, it emerges out of the information. Concept uses forces to, um, to dictate the information. So we, we choose something in particular, and then we use that to organize all the forces, including what type of research we might do, what sort of information we might look at. Um, that can be generally, it's, it's often used because it's very understandable. So if we're communicating to somebody else, it's very easy to say, this is what my project's about. The difficulty with concept frameworks is that um, you can often fail immediately based on relevance. You may actually choose something which is irrelevant, just doesn't matter to your project. The, the real difference between patterns and, force and, and concept is that when we, we use forces, we, we let that information, we do a very large, um, very large sort of gathering of data. We look at lots of things. And then we allow the project to start to dictate relevance. And so it's more difficult to communicate to others because you don't end up with a very strong core. You don't have a single idea that the project's about. And that for some people is very, very difficult. Um, it, I, in my opinion, it actually tends to make much stronger projects. The projects become much more relevant and, um, and the quality of the project tends to be a lot higher just simply because uh, of the way that we've handled the type of information. So I'm gonna run through just really quickly, um, kind of um, a general understanding of what, what a force is, because it, you'll, hear, you'll hear the word constantly, and it's in every discipline. Everybody talks, uh, talks about forces and causes and effects and what makes this happen. And it's for us as, the, as architectural designers, it's really, it's really what we use to make decisions. It's when, and to me, that's what a design process is, right? It's ordering of information and a whole series of decision-making points that start to select which parts are in matter and which part don't, which parts are going to react to forms and which part don't. So again, because I see everything at a, uh, everything I work at is at a conceptual and cognitive level. That's actually how I teach design as well. And so when we look at a force, a force is, anything that's non-formal that affects formal arrangement. So anything that is not, now it doesn't mean it's not physical, it just means anything that's not formal. So we're not talking about compositional elements in space, we're not talking about objects arranged in space. That's not a force, those are the results of forces. And so if we, uh, if we take a look at say, this is a force framework, it's super confusing and uh, weirdly dashed and it's obviously a designer's diagram that it's not comprehensible to anybody but themselves. But at the same time, what it does, what, it, what I want to pull this up for is when we do force-based fra frameworks, we actually have multiple lines of information, lots of them. And each one of those will have a formal effect. And I'll explain that. I'm going to run through a couple of examples and I'll explain what I mean by that. And the framework operates by once we get through an understanding of what sort of effects each of those forces might have by associating them with each other to produce coherence, produce points of efficiency where they'll start supporting each other, that then starts to resolve the project. And like I said, this is actually, to me, uh, it's a much more advanced process. It's a much more advanced set of methodologies than doing concept-based work, which can be superficial, can be, you can do really good work with concept, but, um, but forces produces, produces, generally produce very, very strong projects. It's much more difficult to understand in the process itself because you're, gonna, you're juggling lots and lots of different lines of information, lots of data, and you've got to make decisions somewhere. So if we look at something, this is a project by WorkAC, a New York-based um, practice that this project, uh, which is called Nature City, was looking at uh, a future possible urban development um, at the edge of, um, of another city in um, Portland, I believe. 
And so what they were, we were looking at, this is an urban growth, bound, growth boundary, and they were looking at about how, how a city might develop to be more in relationship with nature. So what does it mean to actually have those two things not in conflict with each other, but in resolution? And they, the, um, the plan on the right is the plan that they, they came up with. And the series, you see the series of um, squares with void spaces. So, and it starts to play with the relationship between what is built space and what is natural space. And to do that, they actually use forces, but they didn't, they, there's no concept in here. So if you, if you said to, in this project, it'd be like, okay, what is the big idea? There isn't one. It's the, the idea is we're going to produce an urban development that integrates well with nature. That's it. And so if somebody gave you that as a project brief, you'd be like, I don't even know what to do with this. But if you look at it through a series of individual forces, so they took things like animal habitats, they took things like, like the vegetation biomes and where, where the, where the uh, blue uh, infrastructure and resources were, where the edges of water and, and the lakes. Um, and they analyzed that for areas of high value and areas of low value. Meaning high value in this case would be things that were non-human that were being highly used, right? So, um, so say um, game trails or, or habitats for certain, certain wildlife species. So they actually became a force as, as the designers started to say, okay, well, we can't build here because that's where the deer are. And we can't build here because that's the resource for these other animals. They actually started to treat a whole bunch of non-human um, constituents as priorities in the project that eliminated certain sites of development. And all of a sudden that started to cluster certain points where things could happen. We still don't have a project though. We just have, in this case, we have, these are uh, natural forces. These are forces that they're using through, um, through the environment, through the terrain and topography and through the animal inhabitants of that, but giving them a value. But once we start building that up, they started looking at circulation forces. They started looking at other infrastructural forces where power generation would occur, how movement might occur. And each one of these was an independent line of inquiry that at some point we had to bring together and, and it produced, and this is very, very quick. I mean, there's a, much, well, there's a ton of uh, images about this work AC project that you can go into a lot more depth. But in the end, they, they made this proposal which ultimately became a balance between the natural, the natural and, and man-made habitats and how those two things would integrate together. But again, it was an emergent process. Um, there was no big master plan. It was, it was allowed to sort of move up and, and develop itself. When we look at forces, we really have, uh, again, this is the way I think about things. This is about information. We have, we have really five major categories of forces. We have environmental forces, sensory motor, ergonomic, social, and cultural. And as we move down on that list, those forces get more complex and less visible. And so when we start dealing with cultural forces, um, they are, and, you know, those are socially constructed forces. Those are things that are agreements between people. But they have, they have, a, they have a large effect in what we do. You know, if everybody in a society really liked the color red, the color that becomes a force that starts to dictate certain outcomes of projects as you start to choose colors for your project. So you have to start thinking about these things as being influences and start and types of effects for you. So the, the other way that I think, I think forces are really um, good to think about is through asset constraint analysis. And so when you, when you find things and you again, all of this is about gathering information. It's all about research. When you start to bring this information in, starting to think about it in terms of your project to whether this is something which is going to be a constraint, something that's going to limit options, or something, whether it's an asset, something which is going to be very positive, where you can build, you know, you can build an opportunity around a desired outcome. You can build, you can build that sort of uh, that sort of interest into what you're doing. And it's this is one of the easiest ways to think about how information affects design, right? And so if you know, if we deal with something and, you know, I work with lots and lots of other design programs. I work in, with industrial design and game design and, uh, and urban and transportation. And so if I'm dealing with something like a human body, that human body is a constraint. So if I want to, say, design a new backpack, 
I immediately have a set of constraints that have to do with the ergonomics of the body. And that's going to limit what the design can do. That's not an, so a constraint in this case is not negative. It's, it's actually a really, really necessary thing to having a design to limit your design outcomes. We'll find this all the way through in, even in, in our architectural environments. If we have pre-existing infrastructure, that's a constraint, right? Does it, you know, does it mean that, you know, that that's a bad thing that we should change it? No, it just means that we actually have to work within existing structures sometimes. And so that'll start to limit the options that we have in our project. So environmental uh, forces are, are pretty straightforward. They're the things that you're very much used to. Um, sun, wind, rain, topography, right? Those are standard site analysis things. The change is how you start to think about them. And so what you're going to do is like, and you're probably all horribly aware of this, and this is, you know, this is incredibly remedial, is that we have air movements that go through buildings. We have, we have, we have, uh, we have solar, you know, we have solar radiation that enters our buildings or restricted from our buildings. But the minute you start thinking about the sun no longer just simply as light, but as something that influences the environment either in a negative or a positive way or through as an asset or constraint, we start to now have formal responses. So in you know, where I live in North America, the difference between a summer sun and a northern sun is actually quite, quite a lot. And there's, if there's a large degree of difference, but there's a larger force base effect which is summer sun wants to be restricted from interiors and winter sun wants to be allowed into interiors. And that immediately creates a formal change as we change our overhangs, we change our apertures and how light comes into a building. We use sun in that way as, as a force. But we can also use sun at a phenomenological way. We can talk about the experience of that sun and how a sun comes into a building, how it comes down a wall. You're still using sun as a force. We're not using it. Uh, we're not using it in this way in sort of a factual nature that has to do with, say, the um, building science. But we're using it as an experiential nature. Is what does it mean for a human to be in that space? Um, wind in some of these. Th some of these are, are quite remedial themselves. They're, these are very very simple diagrams. Um, and when we do force based approach, it does get a lot more complex than this. But you know, if we want to create the ergonomics of a building to resist wind, then the wind is being used as a force. If we have a slope, a topography, if we have cold temperatures, those also become forces. So this is a project, House, house Dam, um, that was done um, on, a, um, on a slope, on a, I believe it's above a ski slopes, and it was a house that somebody wanted. And so this is a force-based project. And if you look at it, it's like, so what's the major idea in the project? There's, there's actually a whole bunch, but none of them are actually major. So how did the project come to formation? How did we make a whole bunch of decisions about this? Well, if you look at the designer's diagram, and some of this is post-rationalized. Um, I don't always believe the stuff that designers put out because we make a whole bunch of stuff up. But if we start thinking about this, right, um, we, have, we have a slope. And if we have a slope, there's only a certain, that's going to be, that's a constraint. That's going to change the way that we can engage the slope, which means we have two ways of engaging the slope. We can either float a house above it or we can put a house into it. Now, if we put a house into it, we'd have to look at a whole bunch of other effects. Like what is the advantage of putting a house into the slope versus putting a house out? Well, if we're dealing with cold temperatures, we actually can end up with thermal mass and we can end up with, with more insulation around the house. So that's actually becomes, becomes an asset. Also now putting the house into the ground is an asset. Okay, how do we reinforce that? What other forces do we have? Landscape, all right? So in this case, they, you know, they brought the green roof onto the top of the house. Okay, now we have to, now we've insulated the house through the asset of the ground, using the ground as a force. We have sun as a force as well. What can we do with sun? Well, we're going to use it to start actually doing some passive heating. Okay, what does that mean? It changes the shape of the aperture. It changes the opening of the building. It changes the formal configuration of the building. Right? But each one of these is a set of decisions that are made in conjunction with other decisions. Right? There's not one overlying like conceptual decision. So we allow these decisions to come up through a series of interactions between different types of information. And so as we move through this, and this, the, one of the problems with this diagram is that it appears to be linear, where this decision making is not going to be linear. There's going to be a lot of things put together at the same time. So as we start to go into the ground, 
we're going to start thinking about okay how does sun operate how does ground operate how does how does thermal insulation operate the interesting thing though with force based frameworks the one thing to remember is that you actually always have to have a starting state and that starting state tends to control what the project does and so a starting state is generally one two to three lines of information that you've decided as a designer is more relevant than the other information that you have. So you're gonna use that information to start to organize the beginning of the project. So in this case, the starting state for this project was the sloped landscape. And the first decision they made was to put the house into the ground. That then starts the project where all the other forces have to align with it. So we still have that coherence that comes out of the project. Um, sensory motor is this is these are quite uh, powerful forces because they they deal with people they deal with the way that we experience the world these are, this is and so sensory motor is how what what we sense how our senses operate what we see and motors how we move and so movement and sight are obviously really really powerful things um, Jean Nouveau did this um, Quay Brambley Museum in Paris as a very very strange cut in the building it seems very it seems overly expressive yeah and so you know is this is this the whim and the will of the designer it's you know no it's actually developed through um, site-based forces because when you're on the inside of the building and you look out you actually get a view that's the eiffel tower and so obviously the, the building in this case the eiffel tower is operating as a cultural force right through site so it's it's a sensory motor forced through sight, it's cultural because of the significance of the object. And so that decision doesn't organize the whole building, it just organizes a small part at that edge of that building that then opens the building up to allow that view to occur. Or we have a standard site analysis. And if we went through and we looked at these rolling fields, I think this is in France, um, we, do a, we do a basic site analysis. Okay, and so our, when we actually look at site analysis, we actually look at mostly uh, environmental and sensory motor information. So where's the wind coming from? Where are the view lines? Where's, where, how is the ground sloped? Where's the circulation paths? Um, and when we look at this, we can actually use these as forces. Each one of these is an independent force and we can decide where and how to site a building and its orientation. So if we want to connect it with some sort of environmental uh, protection, we want to give it a good view and we want to connect it to movement, there's actually very, very few places where this thing can go successfully. And so we, we look at the orientation and the placement of the building based on these forces. Again, there's no conceptual large concept position in here. We're just allowing the information telling us, we're letting it make the decisions for us as we guide that information along. Uh, social information is... is how people, uh, how people interact with each other. So to me, I think about it as two major ways and this is the way we teach it. It's, we teach it through lines and lines and circles and lines are movements and circles are gatherings. So if you start thinking about your environment through the forces of where do people gather versus where do people move, those are two, those are two sensory motor forces. You can actually start to then place a whole series of other things to support movement and gathering. What type of gathering is it? How does the movement occur? What speed is the movement? Where's the, inter where's the interaction between the movement and the gathering? And those all become sites for design engagement. Um, we're all <laughs> we're all horribly aware of this at the moment. Um, social forces like social distancing actually controls and affects spatial composition. And so, if we want to keep people apart from each other. Um, we can do it through a bunch of signs that people ignore, but we can also do it through the through the way that we handle the design of the environment. We we do lots of social interaction as forces when we do office layouts and office interactions and workspaces and any place where we have multiple people together and those people have needs. So we may look at things like who needs to talk to who or what type, what level of distraction is there and what's in the sight line and what type of noise do we have. Each one of those is a line of forces that we make decisions. And we may make a decision, say, that we've prioritized sight lines over, say, acoustic isolation. We have to make decisions over which one is maybe more important. We're not going to probably get everything. Um, we have to be careful not to make mistakes where all of a sudden it turns out the acoustic isolation was way more important than the sight lines. And that becomes the experience of designer and that has to do with the way you do research and where you're setting up the priorities, 
how you deal with, with clients and all the rest of it, you've got to start to understand where the priorities are. You know, when we look at zoning, these are forces that then control, these are constraints that control the, 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 the maximum um, formal composition of the building. Or we can do things where those forces become way more dynamic. And this is uh, this is the project. I think it's described in the one of the chapters in the making. Sorry, the um, revealing architecture book. And this is where um, Tokyo Tokyo sight lines and and zoning ordinances can really do control the shape of the building through uh, constraint. These are force based constraints. Cultural forces get really really interesting. Um, and this, so the form of this building is based on being able to dry your clothes. And so that's, if we think about this as a design force, all of a sudden the extension of that infrastructural support out from the facade of a building becomes a design opportunity that we have to take into consideration. And it starts to control the way the building operates. Or the, um, or the desire the desire to have streets uh, which have interaction or have green spaces or have places to sit. Each one of those is a cultural force because it comes out of desire of a population, not simply the efficiency. So this is no longer about efficiency of movement. This is actually about experience of that movement. Um, the arrival and the interaction of, of cars with uh, types of things that we're going to do. I still, I find this incredibly strange that you should somehow go to a bank while sitting in your car. But, um, you know, this, but I'm not from America and, and, and there's lots of things here that make me quite um, scratch my head quite curious. But because the vehicle, the car is such an amazing, amazing part of the culture and it's so necessary to do anything here because of the distances between things, um, it becomes a cultural force that starts to make decisions over things like um, how a bank is arranged. Or if we move back to Europe, um, the belief of a cycling culture, right, would be is set up that actually starts to control the way that our, our streets are designed. So the the introduction of, say, a place to keep your bike is a force that then starts to change decisions that are in the arrangement of how the street operates. So the things that I, I just want to make sure that you guys understand if you're using force based frameworks, um, there's there's two major, major things. The first one is that you have to be able to select forces that have a formal effect. And that what I mean by that is there's lots and lots and lots of different types of information, but some of it is just not relevant to what we do because it doesn't actually have a spatialized effect. It doesn't change composition within space. And that type of information we can't use. That's not design. That's not what we do in architecture. And so we have to determine what the effect might be, and we have to be careful that the effect is real. So we might think that, uh, you know, that a type of information might change the way that we, we arrange the entrances in a building. It actually might not. So we have to be careful there. The second is starting state. And that means, you know, because force-based frameworks works with multiple, multiple lines of information, you actually, you have to choose something to start with. And the thing that you choose will actually control the outcome of the project. And I've I've done lots of um, I've done lots of student projects with force frameworks, and we can give exactly the same site, exactly the same program, exactly the same um, project information, exactly the same climate, and depending which force actually we can do all the same analysis there. We can do all our research there. We can have everybody can have exactly the same information, depending which person chooses which starting force will radically change what the building looks like and how it's composed. So there's a couple of quick projects I'll run you through. This is a uh, Villa d'Ava. This is an OMA project in uh, out on the outskirts of Paris. Uh, there's, you know, this project usually considered as an homage to Le Corbusier and the Villa Savoie, which is actually in St. Cloud, which is just that way, I'm sorry, it's like north, northwest of this project is on the it's on the other side of the city. But that's actually not what this project's about. This is a this OMA actually uses force bay framework um, almost exclusively. And they what they concentrate on, and one of these, what I think is one of the easiest ways to use this framework is through program. 
And so if you see a lot of OM projects that look, their outcomes are really strange, but they describe them as being hyper-rational or being really logical, but there's no conceptual position within them. They just allow the project to emerge out of the type of information. That's because OMA um, was one of the very first big offices that was a research-based office. They would collect a lot of information and then they would allow that information to, to interact with each other to then make decisions on how the design would operate. So if we look at this project, we say, well, what are all, what are all the lines of decision-making? And you know, why do we have, why do we have a, a soft lower floor? Why do we have the open and, and highly public? Why is the top floor, you know, feeling like a pretty solid box? Why are the windows where the windows are? What's happening on the roof? And if we, we look at where this building is, you know, this is, this is the, um, the site of that building is, is right there. That's the building you can see. And you can see the, we were looking at that back volume that was there, you know, there's a sense of directionality to that building. This is the major street edge. So if we look at, if we look at the building itself and where it's sited, this is a, a fairly typical private residential street on the, on, the, on the South Hills in Paris. It's quite gated. There's not a lot of visibility. So if we were gonna, if we were gonna have a house down in here, we actually don't have, um, we don't have a vista, we don't have a view. The client, wanted something very particular and they wanted several things. And so they, they listed a whole series of things that they, they wanted. And not one of them was a major priority over the others. It was, there was, there's a whole list of them. And so we see this is the way the building then sits uh, above that, that uh, hard street edge. And so the only visibility we have, if you think about it, the only visibility you have for a Vista is one should pass generally the second story. Like you have to be quite high before you can get a view out from that site. And so we get a site plan, and these are this is the way we start to think about that site plan through the way that this, in this case these are social cultural forces and and uh, and some visibility forces. So the topography is quite steep. There's there's a drop in the topography that allows us to start thinking about the site in two pieces. Uh, and the front part we have a public and private gradient. So the um, towards the right side is is high, is more public, even though it has a hard street edge and, and it's quite quite um, as quite a um, closed down street edge, it still is more public because we have services and other things that have to come in. And so that the topography is one aspect of force. The, the, the front nature, the public edge is also another type of force. All of these things are gonna to start to decide where and how that that building is being laid out. Again, not one single decision, but a whole series of them that are interacting with each other. And so we look at the way that that slope operates and we think about this is the front edge of the building now. And you see that the ground floor, its response to privacy is to close itself up, but then to open up the level above it. And so if we go back to the site plan, as we move towards a more public street edge, we actually close the building down. But as we move towards the back, we open the building up. And what does that mean? Is that when we look at the way that that plays out actually on the site, we have, we have a material selection. We have where windows are gonna go. We have that glazed, that glazed floor where it opens it up completely to its surrounding, but then we have a really hard the stone closed up lower floor as we get into a more public realm. And that's possible because the way the site operates. And so as a, as a conceptual diagram, we have this relationship between solid and private and void and public that then starts to organize the project so that, that those two bands are being now pinned in place and say, okay, this is the way we're gonna to start to approach this. But then we introduce more forces as well. Um, this allows that visibility. This is on the back end where we're more private, it allows that visibility. So we're bringing the desire to bring nature into the building. Even though this is a very tight site, how do we start to respond to that? Again, one more decision in a larger set of decisions. And then the big one is we really, it's the French and the, uh, the Eiffel Tower or something, but we want to see the Eiffel Tower. And there was a view of the Eiffel Tower, but the only place you could see the Eiffel Tower was once you were three stories up. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out now the roof of the building becomes an occupiable space. That entire development of that roof is driven by the cultural and, and, um, and um, sensory motor force of wanting to see the downtown of Paris. And so that starts to dictate certain things. 
And then the actual shape of the building, where those two boxes are, is another force. And so if we deal with on the left side, this is a bedroom. And on the right side, that's also a bedroom. But the left bedroom is the parent's bedroom. And the right bedroom is the teenage daughter's bedroom. And so the request was to make sure that those two bedrooms were far apart as possible, which then starts to dictate certain formal decision-making. All of a sudden that starts to push the, um, the program and the boundaries of the building. So now we have site forces, public, public private forces, visibility, uh, visibility exposure forces. We have programmatic forces that have to do with privacy, privacy and repulsion. We have visibility forces that talk about where, the, where and how we can see downtown of Paris. And all of those things are layering together to then create the project. But at no point could you say, this is just what the project's about. It actually is about all of those things at the same time. And so the outcome, the outcome is this, is this project. Um, I thought just at the end, I'll take you through, like, this is a real student project. This is one that was done for me uh, a few years ago, where this is the way, and I want to just sort of run away the way that we would think through a project like this, because it can get really, really complex. And, um, and that's actually not always a good thing. And so um, in this, this is a, a typical site analysis. And so we start, we start looking at um, a downtown site in a, in a college town. And we'll do our standard analysis. We're looking for topography. We're looking for sun. We're looking for wind patterns. Um, and I'm sure this stuff is really familiar to you, right? You've got your wind roses and, and, uh, and uh, temperature gauges. And we even go into things where we start looking at, in this case, um, where we would have probably have reported crimes and where we maybe we'll have some more social cultural issues. So, you know, is there an issue with certain corners? What, what's the circulation like? Where do we have our public streets and our private streets? So we just run all of that analysis. And at this point, there's no decision making. We're just trying to get as much information in as possible. Um, this was a view analysis as well. Um, with, uh, with issues of looking, looking at uh, building heights and, and vistas and visibilities. And what, what we're looking for here is assets. Okay, what do we have that can actually improve the quality of our project? Do we have a really significant view somewhere? Do we have a nice vista? Do we have, do we have a, a very, very active public street that we want to link into? That stuff will start to control where entrances occur, where windows occur. But again, we're not making any decisions at this point. Uh, we run through wind analysis, uh, looking at summer to winter winds, and we're going to think about wind as an asset and a constraint. So where and how do we want to bring it into the building and where do we want to keep it out of the building? And what time of the year do we want to do those things? Uh, this student was actually quite, uh, quite interested in wind and allowed that wind to start to dictate some, some of the first moves. So you can start seeing where massing is starting to be proposed because it's going to act as as a way to block winds or to shelter, to create a microclimate within the site. And so that's one of the, the first moves that were made. And then we'd go into, and I do this a lot, uh, I think program for architects is probably one of the most valuable tools that we have. It's, it's really, a, it's really a, so a, you know, a stand in for much, much more complex um, social cultural issues. So where and how we think about events and how what type of act activities occur and how they're connected to each other is one of is just one of the most um, powerful things that we can do. You see OMA has built, you know, a 30, 40 year office. They deal with program almost exclusively as a design force. They use program to almost control every building that they do. Um, and they've done it very, very successfully. But when we do, when we do say something like a program analysis, we'll actually run this. We'll actually go into quite a bit of depth and say, okay, so what type of spaces do we have? And this is this is actually you see this is an analysis of what light is needed, what type of what quality of light, if they need access to views, what type of privacy levels they need, what else it should be connected to. So we'll run through a fairly deep analysis of our program to start to understand how those pieces want to interact with each other. What pieces need to be kept away from each other? That becomes a force of repulsion. Which pieces want to cluster together because they make each other better or they need adjacency to each other? And so once we have all that stuff, if we're running a, we're running, this is really an environmental program for space analysis. We allow our environment and our site topography and our site information 
to start to interact with the granular level of the program information. And so what you're looking at here is really an efficiency diagram that says, okay, if that space wants a really good view, so for example, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at, you know, say that one right there, that space wants a really good view and it wants access to fresh air and it wants a couple of other things. Where on that site would that go? And all of a sudden you end up with this thing that's up 30 feet in the air. It's fine, don't worry about it. Because the force resolution tells you that's probably the best place for it to be. But it's not designed, it's not resolved through a design yet. And so this is what you do after this. And so you, you let the program fall where it wants to fall based on the analysis of the forces and based on really, if you think about these as organisms, where will that thing thrive? So if I have, if I have a classroom or an office space or a service room or an entrance, where will that thing thrive based on the, based on the environment of the forces that we have around us? And from, from there, we actually move into fairly basic um, plan, plan and massing resolution. And this is gonna be a whole bunch of small tweaking, but this now forms the building. This forms the basis of the building. And from there, we'll start going into more revision. We'll start looking at massing. We'll start tweaking program relationships, but it still follows the, it follows in this case, the major, the major pieces that we've laid out. And so you can, you can see this, the, the plane with the masses, how we start to open up voids in the middle because we want access to views or circulation or air movement. Wind, wind stays as, a, as an important piece. That means certain walls are gonna be exposed and certain openings are gonna be have to certain places to allow that wind to move through and stack effects to occur. And then, um, and this, this doesn't go very deep into the design. This stays pretty much at a massing level. Um, this, is very, this was like a very quick five week project where, where it was mostly about learning how to handle, handle the manipulation of forces and how to, how, how to make decisions based on them. And so we get we get this sort of uh, we get this sort of very very basic level of of uh, project resolution. We go much into this further, but we use the same forces to make the rest of the decisions too. So where material would occur is based on circulation, visibility, and the the placement of bodies and what they experience. Those are all forces that allow us to make decisions. Okay, hopefully I know that was. Quick, I was given half an hour. I think it took 40 minutes. My apologies. But the what I, you know, what, what I want to make clear is that um, to do this, to do this in a in a fairly rigorous way, uh, to use a, a to use a method that's really based on a form-based approach, uh, to use forces as that approach, really means suspending a lot of your own decision making and a lot of your desires until you allow the information. To interact with each other. At some point, you're still going to have the willfulness of a designer in there, but you're you're going to assess that information over levels of relevance, like which has the most effect on the project, which is the most important for this area, for the site, for depending on what you're working on. And you allow the project to then emerge out of that information decision making. The minute you can use forces and concept based as well. And what you would do in that is that you, you do your analysis and you select one or two and you'd almost throw everything else away. But in a force based framework, you allow all of the information to stay all the way through the entire project. And it resolves itself through how you negotiate which, which line of force with each other line of force. So how do you make decisions? It's, it's probably one of the, on, in my mind, it's probably one of the strongest ways of doing really, really high quality work. Uh, there's lots of offices around the world that use this. And this is traditionally, um, it's actually a very standard technique. It's probably uh, one of the, well, it's the second oldest, but it's, it's the one that we use as the foundation of almost every practice. Um, although I don't think it's often done very rigorously. Um, and we, demo, we tend just to use site and program to make a lot of decisions, but we can bring in anything that has a formal effect can be a force. So if you're dealing, I know you guys are working with carbon sequestration. If you're dealing with anything that can start to affect, say, material choices, and that material then has a limited range of how it works, that then becomes a force that starts to control limits. Uh, it starts to limit your project and it starts to suggest ways that that, that project should evolve. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was super quick. Uh, okay. Hopefully it made sense and I wasn't just rambling. So yeah. 
Okay, it's but, very clear for us um, about the explanation related to the forces. And even though it's brief one, but I think it's very rich of information. And you have like a very on point what we are sometimes uh, thinking about how to find the engageable forces. I mean, we have a lot of forces, but how yeah. to define one to start with? Uh, I mean, your uh, I believe that those black um, slide is the best one for us to answer this stage for this design studio. Okay, so before we uh, move on to the um, uh, students' presentation, uh, maybe I will give uh, two students or participants to ask question first to uh, Professor Philip, and then we move on to uh, the students' presentation so that we can still keep the time on the uh, on what we have um uh decided in the email <laughs> okay so uh if you have any question please raise your hand uh directly now because if on a minute there is no question then i will leave it behind okay so we have two now one from shahla and another from from fernanda so we can start from shahla okay shahla you can ask the question now Okay. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Fenty. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Flora. So I will ask a question regarding theory. In uh, yeah, in theory, in our in the framework. So uh, I haven't finished um, the chapter um, theory as an intellectual tool. So uh, I'm not really sure of how how do we use theory uh, within this uh, force-based framework. Um, and it, is every architectural theory compatible with this framework or yeah, is there <laughs> anything, yeah, <laughs> is there wow. anything that just, uh, uh, yeah, there's like, um, what is it, points that, um, yeah, I think that's my question, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, no, it's it's actually a really, it's a really good question. It's um, It's a really big question as well. So um, I'm gonna, so maybe I'm not gonna even answer it this the way that you're expecting. There's so much confusion between what philosophy is. And I, I mean, obviously the generation that I, when I was studying architecture, um, we would read all of this stuff about everything that wasn't architecture. But there was no, nobody ever connected those ideas back to formal composition, which ultimately, I, I, I mean, I, there was a lot of architects who weren't doing architecture. And, um, and so the idea is to understand theory is, is, um, is something that we do that we test. So if you are working in a form-based framework, Theory operates in everything we do. Like there's, there's, it's impossible to practice without theory. But what is important is to understand that we can have ideas and we can have beliefs, but those are not the same as theories. A theory is something which is testable and refutable. And so when a theory is tested and proved to be successful or true, it's not a theory anymore. It becomes a fact. And so when we, when we work in this, the minute you say something like, I think this might happen, that's a theory. And, you know, if we're using force-based framework, the theory is quite heavy within it because it's going to be based mostly in the interaction between the forces. So if, if this force and that force and that force and this force come together, now we're starting to talk about dynamic situations with emergent information. Like we don't know, and this is a beautiful thing about force-based frameworks, you actually shouldn't actually know what happens in the building at the end. If at some point when you start the project and said, this is what my building looks like, you've done it wrong, right? You should actually get to a building where you're like, holy crap, I had no idea this was what, what the building was going to be. But it's based on a whole series of decisions. And each of those points of decisions is a theoretical point. You're like, I think that might happen. And then you test it. And it's like, yes, it's working well. I'm going to leave that in place and I'm going to bring something else in. And then you test it. And so it's mostly, I think most of my frustration is that um, I have a lot of practitioners who don't believe that they work theoretically, but they do. They're just not aware of the information. They're not paying attention to it. And it's not as strong as it could be because of that lack of evidence. And so for you, when, when what I want you to think about with theory 
is that a theory is really just an attitude towards a type of information where you have to test it to see if what you're thinking works or not. And then the question is, how do you test it? And there are some things you're going to test it by building a model, some things you're going to test by doing some drawings, some things you're going to test by showing it to other people, some things you're going to test by mocking up and having somebody walk through it or stand in it, or you're going to test it by putting it in the sunlight and seeing if the sun comes through the way you expect it. Each one of those is, is a theoretical line within your project. But what I don't want you to think about is that for some reason you have to read um, cultural philosophy to understand architecture because you don't. Can it add to it? Yes, it can, it can actually add to it. It can make you think in a different way. It can make you approach because it's cultural, it's social cultural information. It, it can be important, but it's, it's not going to organize architectural responses in a, in a strong way because it's not the right type of information. It has to get translated into forces. And at that point, it becomes formal composition. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so yes. Ironically, don't overthink it. <laughs> don't make it more complicated than it should be because you'll end up just spinning yourself in circles and you won't do anything. That's true. Thank you so much, Professor, for uh, your answer. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Okay, now thank you, Shahla. And now uh, we move on to the second question from Fernanda, right? Okay, so there you go, Fernanda. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Miss Fenty. Um, <laughs> good morning. It's a floor, right? So, uh, firstly, I want to thank you for the lecture. It was so inspirational and gave me a lot of answers about my project in the studio this year. And um, actually, I want to ask about the uh, difference between concept-based and force-based framework in this case. So uh, this year in our studio, we were told by our advisors and our lecturers to use force-based framework. And so, uh, uh, but in reality, well, uh, in my case, is that after I used the, when I found the, my forces, um, the next step, I tend to use um, the concept-based one. Like, yep. um, yeah, that, so I was told again and again by my lecturer to don't yet use the concept-based, use the force-based first. But sometimes I just can't uh, differentiate. I can't draw a line between both of those frameworks. So, uh, well, my question is, what is the clear line? What is the line between the this is force-based one and this is the concept-based one? Right. So, yeah, that's right. my so, question. It, no, it's good too. So, um, and the difficulty is that they both use the same type of information because all design uses the same type of, all design uses forces. It has to do with the steps that you take. And so, you know, if, um, if, you do a, if you do a research, right? If you look into say the, typogra the typography, the, the typology of the project you're doing, you look into your site analysis, you look into the social conditions there, you pull all this information in. If you're doing a concept-based framework, what you'll do is, so that's your divergence. You, you're pulling all your information in, it's collecting your data, that's divergence. If you're doing a concept-based framework, your next step is, the next step in the convergence is uh, probably through something called hotspotting. You would actually scan your information and say, okay, what do I think really matters here? And you'd pull one thing out. And then you would actually then use that to then organize the rest of the project. That's concept-based you would throw away most of the other stuff that most of the other data you collected, you would just ignore. And then you'd use say that one idea you have and you'd use it to organize your program, organize your site response. You'd pull in the other stuff. Like you're not gonna forget that the wind is there and the sun is there, but it's not gonna be as important. You're gonna let, you're gonna let that one idea dominate everything in the project because you're gonna use it to organize all of the composition. That's concept. But with a force-based approach, 
when you do all your data collection, that's your divergence. You actually don't pick one thing. You actually run multiple. You, so you're going to run, you may have 14, 20 lines of information, something about sun, something about wind, something about topography, something about motion, something about program. You're going to run it all. You're going to run it all independently, and you're not going to make a decision. You, as a designer, are going to resist making a decision over too early. You're going to allow that to, you're going to allow them to develop, and you're going to develop a whole series of different formal responses for each of those lines. And so, okay, you know, how does wind work the best way? How does sun work the best way? How does topography work the best way? How does the program work? And you're going to allow those to develop independently. And then, then you're going to allow them to interact with each other and say, okay, if I, if I do wind like this, then the, what, would this, what would the sun do? And if I did this with occupation and program, how would that operate? So if you saw the, if you saw the, the slide where we did the program analysis, at no point did we, it's a flat hierarchy. There's no point did we say one, one room was more important than another. We just did the analysis and then we associated them with parts with the site. There's no, there's no one decision making in there. We've, we've got multiple lines of inquiry working together. And this is why force space is actually quite a complex, um, it's a complex to me, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a really strong way of teaching architecture, but it gets quite complicated because you have to learn how to handle multiple lines of information at the same time without which you, what your instinct is, is that you want to simplify it by choosing one thing and then using it to organize. You go back into concept naturally, but they both, they can both start with the same research analysis. It's resisting making a single decision too early is the key. And allowing the project to emerge out of a whole series of lines of information where there should not be one idea in the project. In fact, the project in some ways should be very difficult to describe. If I go back to the OMA house, the Villa de Alla, it's like, well, what's the house about? It's, it's about the site, it's about the view, it's about the public privateness, it's about the light coming in, it's about the exposure, it's about the way the program, it's about all of those things at the same time. But it ends up being a very cohesive outcome, right? It's not, it's not all random. It's, it's incredibly well thought out, but the house was allowed to merge, emerge out of the factors that were affecting the context. Meanwhile, I mean, the, the other way of doing that house is I'm going to do an homage to Villa, uh, Villa de um, Savoie, and I'm just going to put it on a new site. <clears throat> this is what it's going to look like. That's concept-based, right? So your instinct is that you're going to want to make an early decision, and if you use this framework, you can't do that. You actually have to run parallel lines of formal compositional inquiry, like what, what happens here. What, and then you're going to look for opportunities to how they interact with each other. I still think, I still think one of the easiest ways to do this is through really, really uh, deep program analysis. And program to site interaction is one of the easiest ways to do this. Dealing with, uh, dealing with other things where, where you have to translate, you have to find ways of translation into form become more difficult. And cultural stuff is always, is always hard because it's, it's hard. It's because it's about social agreements. It's about the way belief systems, those become more difficult to address as a designer. Not impossible, but more difficult, more advanced. So, hey. so stop making decisions. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So stop, if... stop using words like I want, I like, I need. Stop any of those I words. Get them out of your vocabulary. Stop. Because the project takes on a life of its own. It's not about what you want. It's about letting the information play with each other and seeing what happens. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, sir. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Fernanda, for the question. <laughs> now, let's move on to uh, the students' presentation. Um, I think we can start from who, Pai Yuan? I think we can start with maybe Faza, and then okay. Safa, and then another. Okay. okay, so maybe we can start from Faza. Faza, are you ready? <laughs> Yes. Um, minutes, okay? Yeah. Not okay. more than five minutes. <laughs> okay. I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> you must. be difficult for Faza. <laughs> okay, Faza. You can start your, your presentation. Yes, um, 
Yeah. Okay, is my um, screen visible? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, good evening, or I guess good morning, uh, Professor Florite and all the lecturers and all fellow students. And uh, today I think I'm going to uh, present my progress so far um, in the Architectural Design 3 uh, in this fifth semester studio. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, my name is Fazan. I'm from the fifth semester of undergraduate architecture student. And yeah, I'm going to present uh, my progress. So uh, to start off with uh, this presentation, um, I'm going to show my table of content, but, but it's not like a typical table of content, but I um, insert uh, your force-based framework in this uh, slide. And then each and every week when I, uh, when I start doing uh, the progress, I highlighted the place where, uh, where is, uh, my progress stands in this framework. So uh, this is the uh, second week progress. And in the second week, I uh, basically try to identify my forces by doing a site selection, uh, studies and research on the given issues or topics and site analysis. So yeah, as you might know, maybe the issue of, or, or the given topics uh, for the architectural student, uh, architectural design three is about reducing future carbon. So yeah, I, I do uh, research and uh, studies um, along those topics. And I found uh, some interesting um, ideas and um, issue that I highlighted that will be later on contribute to uh, the forces that I, that I identify in the end. And so, yeah, I'm just gonna uh, run it down quickly so that uh, you know the uh, overall process. So this is the, when I do a site selection and then I studies the issue about reducing future carbons. And I also do, uh, I also did a site analysis uh, the city context in terms of the uh, where it is in Indonesia specifically, uh, the city context where it is placed uh, in in the city, the neighborhood context, uh, what is the building uh, nearby, and what is the zoning intended in those areas, size and zoning uh, regulations, um, size and etc. Uh, this is the road and accessibility, utility, sensory, climate, and etc., and also sun path. And all of those uh, studies and research and site analysis uh, brought me to a synthesis on what the forces might look like uh, for me and for this specific uh, project. And I, I am, um, at the end of uh, the second week, uh, I identified my forces as zero carbon and comfort. So the building should um, apply a zero carbon and comfort either as forces, pressure or constraint uh, and assets so that uh, I can propose forms best based on this uh, forces. And on the last week or the third week, uh, what I did is I analyzed further the, the zero carbon and comfort forces so that I can identify the design criteria and what I did in this week specifically is I did a force analysis, study case and design criteria, later on stating the design criteria. And uh, the thinking frame that I uh, use in, in these two weeks, in these last two weeks is um, in the left hand side is basically, I try to find the right problems that I want to tackle. And on the right, I try to find the solutions to that problem after I identify the forces which uh, then will lead to the design criteria. So yeah, I do an analysis further about zero carbon. What is, uh, what is it man? And what, what as aspect of zero carbon that I want to focus and also about comfort, especially uh, to respect the fact that my site is located in a tropical country with all those challenges. And uh, I also did a study case. Uh, the first one is uh, a building that uh, that apply the zero emission uh, building standard, but this is not in a tropical area. So I did another uh, study case uh, 
which located in a tropical area and can relate more to my projects. And after that, I came up with one more, a, a synthesis, um, kind of like a, a uh, conclusion. What, what did I learn from the studies, from the precedent? And then after all the site uh, analysis, the precedent studies and et cetera, I came up with this design criteria that the design should uh, blah, 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 and blah, 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 that I have to keep <laughs> in mind in, in, uh, in the later on in the design proposal. And yeah, I hope that it's not more than five minutes. So yeah, that's actually all uh, my progress so far. So go back. Thank you. Um, Thank you so go back. So that that's, um, you're actually blending a couple of things together, which is, um, which is not unusual. And so you know that your your typology your typology studies will actually extract patterns for you, um, and you can use those patterns as forces if you want. The one thing, and I'm I was really glad to see that once you had worked out zero carbon and comfort, you actually need to break that into a lot more. Um, you have to start looking at comfort through all of the ergonomic and the sensory motor information. What does that mean for people? What are the you know what's the temperature ranges? Um, I would start to relate that to certain aspects. I would actually do a side analysis based on comfort as well that you can do with, um, with uh, noise exposure, um, solar exposure, visibility, where, you know, as assets constraints, you could actually break, you could use comfort to do a whole series of studies that both at a site level, at a program level, and at a material level, like you could start talking about um, about how that would start to dictate some materiality and form making. And then the, the carbon zero is really good to see that you started looking at um, a series of selections of say materials that would have um, low carbon, right? You're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to do more of that, of course. And the thing, the thing that you're gonna have to be really, really careful of right now is that you're, it's, you're gonna, your natural instinct is to fall back into, here's the form of the building. And, you're too early for that at the moment. Um, you've got you've got really really good start, and you've got the right type of information. But you're going to have to get more granular um, with both comfort and zero carbon. Um, which you go to your brick, go forward to the one where you had your bricks. Right. There's so we had we had uh, we had um, construction techniques. Right. This is just going to be one line. So you're gonna you're gonna hold this line and 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 look at this. You're gonna look at maybe all the variations of how how the um, you know how this can go together, how the the bricks can actually be assembled. But you're not going to make any decisions right now because um, this is going to just be one of the forces. Uh, you probably are going to have other. You should have other materials as well that are zero, zero carbon materials that maybe do other things that these things are going to start to support each other. Um, and so as you let those lines come out, you're not going to make your decision until this material, this choices, the comfort, the site, all of that stuff comes together. You're going to actually put all of that together on the site to then start to, to resolve um, formal composition, like where, where and how it might work, right? So there's, there may be some asset from the bricks. There may be a particular form of the bricks that actually starts to improve or, or conflict with the, with the zero carbon side of it, right? There may be a secondary material that comes in that, that blows your carbon footprint that you have to then think about as well. We may wanna think about how that starts to interact with things like visibility or circulation or air movement as well. So each one of those lines is gonna be an individual, an individual inquiry. Um, and then when, you know, the, when we move to say the outcomes from your case studies and you went back to those four diagrams you drew, you have to be really careful here because these are actually patterns um, and you can use them, but you have to not give them, you have to not give them prominence. You have to just allow them to be one line in, in the, in the study. So if, you know, if the, um, if a central, a central shaft or a core within the building that produces a stack effect and it's used for thermal regulation, that becomes a force where you punch that through. You actually want to have a lot of other stuff done first before you stick that hole through the middle of the building because it's going to have quite an interesting effect and then you're going to look at where that becomes an asset or constraint so say that you had arranged a series of program elements that were based on comfort first right you really 
in some ways you have to decide whether you're going to run the comfort line or the um, or the net zero line or the the uh, sorry carbon zero line first um, and say if you ran the comfort line and you started to arrange a whole series of elements on the site and then you can came in with the carbon zero and it it started to punch through or push things away opened up voids it changed the way it changed the way that the, the facade operates. It, it creates it creates more depth and all of a sudden it starts to interfere with circulation. And so the force based approach would, would really be you resolving the conflicts and the interactions between different lines of expectations with the project. And it actually creates sometimes, well, most of the times it creates things that you didn't expect, it creates opportunities that you could never have thought of by yourself if you were just working with, with singular levels of information. So I think you're actually at a really, really good spot. Um, you just have to be really careful. Um, the next few steps you have to be really careful with. And I would, I would probably get into the site and I would start looking at types of occupation based on comfort. And I would see how they get arranged. I wouldn't put too much of your own willpower into it. I just let things fall where they need to be. And then I would bring in the, the carbon neutral information and it would actually, it's going to start to interact and react to uh, what you've already put in place. And from there, your project will start to emerge. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I still try to uh, understand um, in, in the overall context, but um, if I can ask a question, can I ask a question, uh, Wendy? Please. Oh. Yeah, so uh, this is actually the thing that I also um, came up to my mind when I did this precedent study. So how how can i do this precedent studies without the pattern on it affecting my uh my form uh, proposal in the next step because i yeah. already have a force i already have um certain things that i want to focus from that force but this precedent studies giving me some pictures on um the patterns that are already successful i must say and how I how do I prevent myself to right use or repeat that pattern again? So un, unpack yeah. unpack the patterns, and what I mean by that is that um, the patterns are um, the patterns actually have forces in them, and so because the patterns codified. So if we look at say the stack effect, the pattern is the movement of air and the the production of the the compositional re response to that pattern is that if we restrict or allow air in certain areas and we vent it in other areas, we produce air movement. So that is a pattern if you draw it like that. But if you take it to the concept level where and, and using concept in, in a way that is going to confuse you, so my apologies. If you take it to the informational level where you talk about the fact that you need air to come in and the apertures are a certain size and you need air to go out and it's in a different location, the apertures are a certain size and you just leave it at that level of information, you can let go of the pattern, right? And so you, I, what I would recommend that you do is that you abstract each of these diagrams into the essential information and then you let go of the pattern because it will make it more confusing for you. And then once you have that information, so say that you have that you, that air operates in a certain way if you if you gave me so here's another way of doing this if you if you gave me 10 projects of formal resolution so go on your site and draw or model what this thing would look like if it was just responding to wind and then draw or model what it would look like if it's just responding to the sun and then draw and model what it would look like if it was just responding to view and then do it for circulation so you end up with say 10 or 12 different projects and then put them together and see what happens right do a do a, a boolean subtraction put put each of those formal and then carve out Right. So if circulation, what happens when the circulation goes through the sun needs? How would I have to adjust it? What happens when I have to have the apertures for the air? And in the end, it'd be like, what does it look like? And you shouldn't know until you do the final steps. All right. So as a technique, what I'd suggest is that you actually make a, build, a building form for 
each line and you say i've chose my force you don't in a force based framework you don't have a force you have lots of them and at your level i wouldn't do too many i would i would maybe i would maybe pick somewhere between 5 and 12 right what whatever you think you can handle and for each of those i would actually do a formal resolution for each one of them but not allow any of them to dominate and then the final step is say that you've, you've chosen eight forces. You've got one on the brick. You've got one on views. You've got one on, on air movement, right? You have each of those as independent pieces. What happens when you just, like if I was doing this in a 3D model and I had, I had physical models, what if I put them all together? <laughs> what would happen, right? So not, not one of them dominates. So it's not the project about air. It's all of them at the same time, all right? And then it becomes your task as a designer is to resolve the conflict and the assets and constraints between multiple forces. So how does Sun, how does sun operate with, within wind? How can sun actually help wind? So if I heat an area up and I create a stronger air movement, so how can those two forces interact with each other? Just make the decisions. How, how would I move through it? So how does then circulation move through that? So at no point do you have one of the forces dominated. They're all interacting with each other. So it's a flat, it's actually a flat hierarchy, right? Where concept is a hierarchical approach, force, a force-based framework has a flat hierarchy. Right. Everything's right. important all at the same time. So that's one technique I would use if, I, if you're struggling. I think that's an easy way of doing it because it will force you into, into eight or 10 or 12 physical resolutions that then you actually have to bring together to resolve. And it won't allow you, you shouldn't choose one of them. It won't allow you to prioritize one over the other. Right, okay. I see, yeah, that's a very insightful um, answer, I guess. Or <laughs> you, you were doing really well until the I guess at the end of it. So <laughs> because yeah, I think I need to replay this recordings to you know to really um, get all the information. But yeah, I get the yeah. general idea. I get yeah. Look, this is this is complicated. It is right, and if it if yes. it wasn't, you wouldn't have to be in school and study it. Right. True but it can make really, really strong projects. All right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. I guess. Sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, Baza, for your great presentation. Now, um, now I think uh, we have uh, one more presentation. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah we're good. Yeah, then after that, sorry for the other. <laughs> you have to work with your supervisor. <laughs> so, okay, now let's move on to the second uh, presenter. Uh, Shafa, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so are you ready to give your presentation? Yeah, Bu. Tapi saya mohon maaf, uh, presentasinya dari Miro, nggak apa-apa, Bu. Soalnya saya tadi saya export, tapi error gitu. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, as long as you can present your work. So I would like to suggest you just doing it very um, rigid and quickly, like briefly, like uh, what Faza did. Um, and I will give you the announcement if the time is up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, first, I, I would like to apologize in advance because I haven't translated some of my works to English. Yeah, you uh, have to translate it, <laughs> to explain it to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just the beat idea, maybe. Okay, uh, okay. So, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Polaroid. So, uh, in this project, I think the first, the very first step that I do is pretty much the same as uh, similar to Baza, but I uh, decided that there, there will be three main uh, topics that I would like uh, that I would discuss first is the site and the location and the analysis the issues which is commercial building and producing future carbon and what I do uh, regarding these issues is I define it at, part, uh, at first I de I define it and then I um, research about what's happening right now the status quo and then I uh, research about the issue what's happening right now uh, the issue 
uh, for example, uh, the issue regarding carbon emissions in Indonesia, and then how we can respond to it. Maybe uh, this is the uh, simplified. Uh, maybe this is Shafa, the Sorry to interrupt. Would you mind to close the uh, note section on the right side? It's a little bit unclear for your presentation. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> and this is uh, perhaps the uh, simplified diagram, I guess. Uh, and the first thing that we the first thing that we do is um, we had to come up with three sites, three different sites uh, options, and we uh, analyzed the strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. And then, uh, before deciding which side I would uh, choose, I decided to um, research about first commercial building. Uh, I defined it. I, I looked up the determination and the aspects regarding uh, commercial building. And this is pretty much regarding the uh, brand image uh, and stuff like that. And then the sub issue is I, I thought about post COVID hospitality trends. And I, I made a prediction that because uh, the because of the prolonged PPKM is pretty much the uh, community activities restriction, I guess. Uh, because of that, I guess people are getting bored at home because we have to stay, we are still uh, pretty much required to wear masks and stay at home. And the fact that uh, a lot of people are getting vaccinated right now, I feel like when the restriction is lifted, people are getting, uh, people are looking forward to uh, hospitality or leisure activities. And then uh, the concept that I want to use for my design is the uh, cradle to cradle design uh, as a response to uh, carbon uh, reducing future carbon. And then this is uh, carbon emission, uh, a research regarding carbon emissions. Uh, I define uh, the definition of it and what's happening right now in Indonesia and what's the issue. Uh, and then uh, this is the uh, issues that we, that I think needs to be, uh, that I need to respond to in my design. And then I feel like this is uh, where I, I, made, I made a mistake of uh, researching just very, very random stuff instead of um, uh, instead of like knowing where I'm about to go to uh, from here. And so uh, this is pretty much uh, this uh, material exploration. Uh, and this is, I think this is uh, regarding energy use, eco-efficiency. And I, uh, from here, I'm planning to upgrade it to eco effectiveness because this is actually inspired by Willie McDonald. Uh, I uh, last semester I read his book and he said in his book that being less bad is no good. So I I plan to uh, make innovations uh, in my design so that it's not just uh, being less bad and just reducing uh, uh, the uh, carbon, but also making it a little bit better. For example. Maybe I can produce my own energy or something, or I can re uh, recycle the materials so that there will be no carbon emissions. Uh, and then this is uh, the uh, Hanover principles uh, that will be incorporated to my design criteria. And, and uh, this is the uh, Hanover principles that I felt like I need to highlight. For example, the uh, accept the responsibility of the, uh, for the consequences of design decisions upon human well-being, and this is uh, an example of uh, an apartment block in China that uh, is now abandoned because uh, the uh, biophilic design is not it was not done very well, uh, and this is the site analysis. I think the site analysis is pretty much is almost uh, the same every time I do it uh, because it's. The climate is either it's raining or it's not, but I think in this case, um, I think I should. Uh, I'm so sorry. The uh, connection is very very bad. Okay, so I think the time is up, Shafa, <laughs> for the explanation. So yeah, I think we can go to. Uh, Professor Phillips comments on what uh, Shafa has has done. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. My, I think my my work is not uh, as good as uh, the other students. 
I think it's just not, slow no, down, it, moving, don't move oh, around. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah. Um, it's so you have lots and lots of information. Um, I don't think you. I don't think you should apologize for that at all. Um, I think the difficulty you're going to have is the translation. It, it, it's a scale issue. You're dealing with really, really big ideas, and you're going to have to find a way of translating them into architectural effects. And so there has to be more specificity. You have to drop the scale. So if you if you think about something um, like uh, the cradle, the cradle process, you can't leave it at that scale, it won't work. And you actually have to think about what that is as a force. And so if you're making a decision, you also have to, you also have to understand where and how that decision comes into your project. So if, if it has to do with recyclable material, that actually doesn't have a formal effect, not immediately. Um, it may be about the way connections happen, right? It may be the fact that all of all of the structure is is bolted in, instead of um, you know, or assembled in such a way for disassembly. That doesn't change the way we can compose the space. It changes the way the connections operate, and so that becomes quite difficult. It's very hard to make some larger scale decisions based on something like that, because it's it's not going to give you the right type of information. And again, you know, if 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 there's anything, if I, you know, if the, my mantra over and over again is that you have to stop thinking about, you know, design as being an aesthetic thing, you've got to start thinking about design as the manipulation of information. And so, and you've got to understand what scale that information is operating on, because some of it is just too big for what we do. Um, some of it might be in the case of, say, you know, deciding on on how uh, two pieces of structure go together. That doesn't occur in the early phases of a design project. There may actually or you have to find what the effect is. So all of a sudden you say, okay, if, if we're gonna design for disassembly, how does that limit my structural options? How does that limit my spans? Does it mean that I can only use, I can only use um, structure that is no more than five meters, right? And if it does, all of a sudden now we'll say, okay, well, what does that now mean for my program when I need a large span space? How do those two things, those are two forces that are in, in conflict with each other. How do I resolve that? And that's where the design innovation comes in. But you have to find a way of translating all of the information you have into an effect at the right scale that will help you make decisions in your project. And so, um, and we, we know that at a compositional level, that should be at site and program scale at this point. It, sh it generally is the easiest way to do it. There are, there are other ways, but that will be the easiest. So if you think about, so if you don't think about the, the um, the attachment or the, the way the mechanical connection between two, two uh, pieces of structure, but you think about the spans, that's a change in scale that actually has a different effect, right? And so we're no longer thinking about how two pieces of ob two objects connect to each other, but we think about how that might limit a volume of space instead. And again, like in the last one, I would run, I would run these all parallel to each other. And so you're gonna have you're gonna have some like I don't think you can build an entire project around cradle cradle, um, because it's in almost every it's it's in the scale of that information is actually throughout the project. It's a more of an it's more of a worldview and an attitude towards how you're making how you're arranging a whole series of things, but it's not gonna operate at a formal resolution scale. It's not gonna work at a compositional scale where it's not gonna allow you to arrange volumes and spaces in a particular way, the information is just not at the right scale to do that, if that makes sense. So this is my, my advice to you is that I think you're going to have, you've got really good information. You've done lots of good research. For each of these lines, I think you're going to have to translate it into, you're going to change its scale and you're going to have to translate it into an effect um, at, a, at a site compositional program compositional level. And unless you do that, I think you're going to have, I think you're going to find this is really difficult. Because you're just not going to know how to make a decision. You're not going to know if this, this is better than that or that, how that interacts with this, because nothing's at the right scale for the project. And, and I'm talking scale on an informational level. Sorry. Um, sometimes, yeah, there's lots of stuff going on in my head. And sometimes I speak and nobody understands me, but...
Okay. So it'd be it's it's quite interesting. I mean, like I said, you've you've got lots and lots of good. You've got you've got such a good start. Um, if you get that translation right, you'll have everything you need in the project. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Because that that that's just, that is actually what I wanted to ask uh, about uh, translating these informations to architectural forms. Because I feel like that's my weakness. Yeah, it's a lot of people's weakness. It's it's actually really hard to do well, um, but you know, it's it's being able to scale it up and scale it down. So if we're dealing with so if we're dealing with a brick like the last project, to choose a brick actually is not an architectural scale because it doesn't. It's about how the bricks go together. And if you take a look at say, there's a there's an older office called Office uh, Office Da that did some really amazing brick buildings in China, and they started playing with with uh, the the bond pattern and where they pull bricks apart, and they ended up creating openings and views and windows. Even though they're using brick walls, they could curve the brick, and that was just a formal investigation, not about the brick, but how the how the brick could start to associate with other bricks to produce different forms. And then we'd have to then use forces like circulation and view and other forces that then would then dictate how that form would be would be shaped in space, right? In the end, I mean, in the end, ultimately, um, I think your the the struggle with this project because it's such a relevant project and it's it's dealing with really high level stakes that has to do with sustainability and, and carbon issues. It's finding the entry point to how to translate that at a material and social cultural level to site conditions and program conditions. But don't make one decision, right? Allow, you, that's the, the key to doing this approach. You don't have a force, you have, you're gonna have a bunch of them. Okay. Is that clear, Shafa? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so you don't have <laughs> you don't have any question? Um, no. So, so I job. <laughs> okay, that, that's great. Thank you for your presentation. So uh, yeah, so that's a wonderful um inputs from Professor Paul, right? Um related to your progress in uh, the design studio now. And I believe that unfortunately, we don't have more time <laughs> to do the um, tutorials. So I believe I would like to apologize for other students who wants to um, present their work in front of Professor Philip. Maybe another time you will have amazingly um, enough time to do your presentation. Um, but for now, I think we must say thank you for Professor Philip for coming to our um, online meeting in the tight schedule of his. <laughs> so he must run to another meeting. Um, so today I can conclude that uh, there are so many on-point information that have been explained by Professor Phillips related to the forces, particularly in the uh, application of force-based approach in our design. And one thing for sure is we can see that more students are trying to uh, get obstacles in uh, engaging with the forces. The first thing that uh, uh, cope that the first thing that has been coping, coped by the students is trying to engage with the forces, Professor Philip. So many students struggling with uh, how to find the engageable forces. Like uh, I. I would like to suggest them to think that forces cannot be too general, cannot to be very specific because it must be engageable for the, for the formal and spatial exploration. But those, uh, my explanation is not enough <laughs> because they don't know what is uh, too general, what is too specific. But I believe that from your explanation before, I think it's uh, very clear for us how to engage and how to find an engageable forces for our uh, project in the future. I hope yeah. that it will enlighten them, yeah. No, I mean, you're, abs you're absolutely right. Um, and you're, and it's not easy. That's, that's the thing about this, it's, it's, but if you do it properly, it's very rewarding. Um, so, and we just saw in the last project, it's, 
scale scale matters. Um, translating ultimately because what we do in architecture is a formal manifestation within cult social cultural space. We 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 put objects into space for the use of people. That's what we do. If we have very large scale ideas like carbon sequentiation, okay, that's too big. Okay, so what does that mean? And so from there, if you can start to associate it with material properties and then material property with formal compositional properties, then you actually have an inroads into the project. But that's not gonna be enough to do the whole project because it's it, it doesn't hold the rest of the information that we need, which are, you know, well, like I said, if I if I run down the, the five major categories of information, we go from environmental, sensory motor, social, cultural, ergonomics. A really good project has all of those in it at the same time. And so finding, finding, finding that way of translating, and ultimately it's going to be compositional. It's going to be about situated and spatialized information. So if if this goes into space. If it's at a small scale and it's granular, then it's going to have other forces react on it, which will like circulation, which will then change, right? So if we're dealing with a brick wall that goes together in a certain way, and we, and so that as a force is, is a decision to choose a certain type of brick because of the way it handles carbon, that's not going to actually build the building for you because it's going to just be one element, but allow it to be in there. And then bring light in and bring circulation in and bring in, bring in occupation and types of activities. And then all of a sudden those two things start to operate or those three, four, five things start to operate together to start to propose what the form looks like. But yeah, it's uh, scale, informational scale is, is definitely difficult and relevancy is always difficult. So. Right. Okay, uh, I think we have a great evening today. So uh, we would like to give a special thanks to Professor Philip for once again coming to our classes. Um, and maybe, uh, do you have any closing remarks for this lecture, Professor Philip? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, I mean, I'm, I just, you know, I really appreciate um, the diligence and the, and the work that you are all doing. Um, ultimately it's, you know, the, the goal is to educate much smarter and more um, and architects with more capacity than in our last generation. I mean, that's what we do this for. We're, we're actually trying to make you guys better than us. And so I appreciate that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. <laughs> so thank you for coming for this morning in uh, Michigan. And now I think this is the end of the class. Thank you for all participants who have come, who have come to this uh, meeting and the uh, recording will be available in the following week, I believe, because I'm a little bit busy <laughs> to upload it into YouTube of our department. So just uh, wait for the information about the publication. And thank you again for Professor Fluoride and then also other colleagues from the Department of Architecture and also students who have presented well and also listening to the lecture. See you in the next guest lecture. Thank you, Professor Philip. Bye. Bye. Okay. Baik, untuk um, kuliah hari ini, sebentar saya stop dulu. <laughs>